Now, what I want to get away from is I want you to get away from having any static model of God. Do not have, do not think that any set of explicit statements can capture God and that you can have God figured out any more than you could figure out your spouse with a few sets of explicit statements. That would be disrespectful. Okay, be disrespectful. And when we do that to God, we are creating an idol and we are worshiping that instead of God. In order to really worship God the best of your ability, to the degree that you can, you kind of need to keep yourself guessing about what God is. And, or, or another way to say that is don't settle on any one particular model of God. We, we kind of have this... Huh, Culturally, we have this like Monty Python version of God, this old man with a long beard sitting up on a cloud somewhere, making all these decisions and interacting with his creator in kind of the way that in the Greek mythology, you know, Zeus might do. And that's not the image that we get from Scripture. And what I want to do is, is I want you to keep rotating that model and entertain a variety, an ecology of models of God so that we don't become idolatrous and make explicit that which cannot be made explicit, which is the highest, the highest form of profanity that we can do is to try to make explicit that which cannot be made explicit. So when we look at our view of God, when we're in our third tier over here, um, our understanding of God, I want to start with Galatians 6, 7, and I want to point out some things that have the same attributes as God. In Galatians 6, 7, it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. So if you sow to your ego... But he that soweth to the Spirit, your authentic self, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing. So if I were to ask you here, what is the uh, formula for life everlasting as we find it here? What would you say? Don't go to your doctrine. Don't go to what you think is right. Don't go to what would make Brother Melms happy or the church happy or the the Baptists that you came from, don't, don't worry about what they would think. Think about what this verse says. What is the formula for life everlasting in this passage? I didn't write this, by the way. Somebody did a hit piece on me that I just saw today where they're accusing me of being a, a lordship salvation, works salvation Calvinist. <laughs> My wife and I got quite a laugh out of that. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Kind of brings us to this whole idea of salvation. So I like to think of salvation as a fractal thing. We, we treat salvation like it's an escape plan from planet Earth. But what we don't realize is that salvation in Christ is, it means that every second, every thing, every situation is salvageable in Jesus Christ. It's not just an escape plan for the afterlife. It is, it is a here and now thing that we have access to all the time. Through Christ, we can bring salvation to so many scenarios. We, Christ in you, in, you know, Jesus even said, you, should, you shall do even greater works than these. Well, who's doing that? When are you going to start? <laughs> let's have it. Let's do it. Let's believe that. And let's do it. And I'm not talking about miracles and gimmicks and things like that. I'm talking about going into your second tier, second tier consciousness so that you have, so that your sincerity, I'm sure you are sincere, but so that that sincerity can have a higher capacity and generativeness of love and transformative capability for yourself and for everyone else around you. You can make so many things around you better 
when you transform into a higher capacity of love. So, if you were to expand, this is called the law of sowing and reaping, this verse is. The law of sowing and reaping. And Hosea says, if you, they sow the wind, they shall weep the whirlwind. All right? Now, if you were to expand on the law of sowing and reaping ad infinitum, I think a guy named Alfred North Whitehead has done this, okay? In his book, Process and Reality, and his entire, sometimes it's called process thought, sometimes it's called process theology, sometimes it's called process philosophy. Doesn't matter what you call it, but essentially what's going on with what Alfred North Whitehead has done is he has essentially taken the motion component of sowing and reaping and he's expanded it all out. And it's amazing. And I highly recommend that looking at it that way, people consider what Alfred North Whitehead has to say. Process theology. Process thought. However you want to say it. Okay? And so another way you could say this, if you think God hates the workers of iniquity, you could take something like, I'm going to make, I'm going to make some statements, and you're going to understand the statements after I explain them. I could say something like this. If you jump off a tall enough building, you will die. Okay? It's, it's a process. We understand gravity and are, we are smart enough to realize that you don't defy gravity. I mean, of course, you can get into a plane and things like that, but we understand we have two different forces. We have wind resistance, airspeed and airflow and, you know, Boyle's Law, all this kind of stuff. We have that and, and we have gravity and we can get in the flow with that. It's a process. Gravity is a process. Airflow and lift is a process. We understand these processes so that if we get in the proper flow with them, we can use them in the same way that uh, a sailboat uses the wind to make himself go forward, to propel himself forward with a sail. So it's, it's, like, it's like understanding reality like a river and getting in proper flow with it. Getting in proper relation to the flow of the river of reality is really what we're trying to do here. Um, I could say something like, if you don't eat and stay active, you will get weak. And you will eventually die if you don't eat at all. Or I could say something like this. The river is not friendly to those who sleep in their canoe. Right? And you could say the river of reality is not friendly to those who stay sleeping in their canoe of first tier consciousness. Which is why he says, wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. When people are in their first tier consciousness, all this stuff up here, they are asleep in the canoe on the river of reality. They're not in attunement with reality. They're not in right relationship with reality. They are as asleep as can be. And, and if you might be thinking of a canoe on a peaceful, serene river, uh, think of a canoe and like where you would go white water rafting, okay? You gotta wake up and you better get in attunement with that river quick or it's gonna kill you. The same river, we, had, we just, I live in Baton Rouge. We just had somebody, I think two weeks ago, die in the Mississippi River. The same river that can help you transport millions of dollars worth of goods every day can also kill you dead. Right? And so the flow of reality, the Mississippi River, hates the workers of iniquity, hates people who aren't in right relationship with it. Not that it is exhibiting any particular decisive hatred toward anything, but it's just you got to be in right relationship with that thing or it's going to bite you. It's going to get you. That's how it is. So to say that God hates all the workers of iniquity, it's that kind of thing to where the reality that is God is, has a particular flow to it. And if you do not get an atonement with that flow, it will kill you. It, and, you know, the word sowing and reaping 
hate in the east they use the phrase karma okay the river is not friendly to those who sleep in their canoe and the river of reality is not friendly to those who sleep in their canoe of first tier consciousness wake up our understanding of god i've asked you seek to never have a static model of god and the Jews are pretty smart about this. They avoid saying the name God altogether. And if you're ever in an online discussion with them, they will type G underscore D because they take that kind of thing very seriously. But the uh, any static model of God is idolatry. It is profanity. And you want to avoid that at all costs. And that's one of the problems with all of our... Uh, our church model people who have followed after the world and created worldly versions of churches where we have propositional statements that are killing people. <laughs> propositional statements instead of actually worshiping God. We got that from the world. That's, that's, that's us being worldly and secular. We didn't get that from God. So there are some things that share the attributes of God. And I want to share these with you if they're too small and to make this a little bit bigger. The future shares some attributes of God. You realize the future is all-knowing. The future is omnipresent. It's immutable. You cannot stop what it will bring. It is omnipotent. It has all the power to do what it's going to do. Guess what you do to this future? You sacrifice to the future. You ever pay for a college course? You sacrificed to the future. You must keep it pleased. You ever save any money in a bank? You must keep it pleased. If you do not keep the future pleased, it will judge you harshly. What else has some attributes of God? The law of sowing and reaping. Guess what? It is all-knowing. It is omnipresent. It's everywhere. It is immutable. You cannot stop it. It is omnipotent. It's all-powerful. You sacrifice to it, and you must keep it pleased. That's the law of sowing and reaping. We're not even talking about something that is animate here. Your future self. As far as you are concerned, your future self is all-knowing. As far as you are concerned, your future self is omnipresent because it will have been everywhere you have been. And your future self will judge you harshly. When, you, when, when the concept of God comes to my head, I start thinking of things like this rather than an old man with a beard sitting on a cloud. Okay? Because these are the practical things give me existentially what my what i need to carry forward in the spirit of my journey i need to be in right relationship with these things other concepts that expand our understanding of god perhaps the concept of the numinous or you could say everything in the unknown is god you could say that now notice these are not dogmatic statements these are things to help us not have a static model of god a network of collective consciousnesses, thanks Donald Hoffman. That which judges, your future judges you, your posterity will judge you. Think about how we all judge Adolf Hitler, okay? Your future self. The market is a collective consciousness. It is a distributed cognition. Um, the combined actions and thoughts and states of being for all things throughout all time and eternity. You can think of that as God in a way. That which does not think. By the way, if God, you say, well, it doesn't make any sense. If God is all-knowing, do you realize that that would also mean that he could never think? Because as soon as he thought, as soon as he had a thought, that would be something else to know. Therefore, it would have to be something that does not think. That which never reacts. That which is always proactive, always ahead of the game. It is never reactive. That which is inevitable. You can think of God that way. That which is inevitable is God. Created all things out of nothing. Uh, that which will come to pass. That kind of thing. Um, all people believe in these things. If, you, if, you, like if you're talking to an atheist, and this is some, sometimes, this works better in person than online. Trust me on that. <laughs> but you can test it out. Every atheist believes in everything that's highlighted right there. Every atheist does. All people believe it. Some people use the label God to refer to some of these things. 
the hierarchical arrangement, oops, God could be the hierarchical arrangement of that which is. Or maybe something like the Akashic Record. Or just that which is. So when it when it comes to God, and there's some other models that I that I use, which some people aren't quite ready for, but I like to entertain the dramatic view of God. And I like to entertain fractally the idea of what I call a traumatized dramatic view of God. Something like uh, if somebody is traumatized and they wind up with dissociative identity disorder and they might wind up with 17 different personalities all floating around in their head because everyone's head is not, you think of yourself as one person, but actually you are a network of collective consciousnesses. And if we were to cut your corpus callosum, you could try to get something out of the cabinet with one hand while the other hand is trying to shut the cabinet and stop you from doing it. All those things are already in there right now, but you mediate them and you bring them. Isn't there a part of you that wants to get up and go to the gym and a part of you that doesn't? Isn't there a part of you that uh, wants to eat the cupcake and a part of you that doesn't? You think of yourself as one unified individual because you have all these things unified with, with a command tower up in the top of your head. Well, some people get injured and they no longer have, they, all these different things are no longer unified. And they all have their own will, and there's nothing, there's nothing pulling them into some kind of unification. So when the Bible talks about there was a war in heaven, and the fall, and the curse, I think of this fractally, it's almost like the entire cosmos is one individual that has a head injury, and has split into billions of different personalities. And then when uh, Christ reconciles them all back together, that is the reunification of of everything back into the the unified person, the unified individual. And like I said, these aren't dogmas. These are just kind of thought experiments to that that help me interface with reality in many cases, that help me be more compassionate with people and, and give me insights and parts of understanding with with people. Um, but I don't stick with any of these as high confidence margin, this is an ontological reality. Because we've reduced religion to having a proper description of ontological reality that we can make explicit. But what religion is supposed to be is rebinding us to what is real, to your authentic self, to God. Religion is supposed to be rebinding you to that. And what it should do, instead of you thinking you're right with the correct ontological description of what is, you need to have something with you to carry forward to act appropriately on your journey. That's what it's supposed to equip you with. And that's what you need to know that you need to take with you. 